Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Automotive EMI webinar. Uh, we're going to start in just a few minutes. I see that there are still folks uh, joining us. Now, today is our third automotive focus webinar in our ongoing series that we launched this year. Uh, for those who were, were here in the summer, we inaugurated this series with our Fundamentals of EMI. And this was really for providing some foundation on the hot topic of EMI. We talked about uh, what exactly is EMI, its sources in power supply design, and how to generally reduce it. Our second webinar, which was last month, this covered the topic of AEC Q100 qualification. You know, we found through many discussions, a lot of our customers who are working on automotive systems, of course, require AEC Q100 grade products, but they might not know exactly what this entails. So our second webinar provided a really great background on automotive qualification, uh, explaining the different types of reliability testing that goes into certifying an automotive product, and also discussed how the different grades of solutions that MPS offers, automotive, industrial, and consumer, are produced and tested in different ways. So folks, stay tuned as next year, we're gonna have even more episodes of the uh, automotive webinar series. We're for sure going to continue exploring the hot topic of EMI. We'll have focus sessions covering specific topics like spread spectrum, and we'll dive into other more general automotive power management uh, topics. Now, just a few quick announcements before we begin. Um, inside of your Zoom app, you should see a menu option for Q&A. So throughout today's webinar, if you have questions, please go ahead and submit those through the Q&A app. Um, at the very end of our webinar, Jens will go ahead and address these one by one. If you have any other questions uh, that come up perhaps after this, you're always welcome to email us at automotive at monolithicpower.com. Uh, and we will make this webinar available for streaming after today's session, as well as uh, provide the presentation material uh, in a PDF format. And so now, without uh, further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jens Hedrick, who's going to talk today about pursuing an ideal power supply layout in the context of EMI. Okay. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm Jens Hedrich. I'm FAE at Monolithic Power Systems since 2010. I'm mainly supporting automotive and industrial customers in Germany and Europe. During the last years, I had a special focus on improving the EMC performance of our automotive evaluation boards. And also, I spend a lot of time in EMC labs to do this and in addition, helping our customers troubleshooting EMI issues. Before working at MPS, I was FIE at Linear Technology for almost 12 years. There, I supported one EMC clean evaluation board, the so-called DC 1212. Before I came, became FIE, I was four years hardware design engineer at Nokia mobile phones. I worked on an early automotive telematic solution with e-call and emergency battery. The agenda for today, some quick motivation slides. We will study initial PCB real estate planning. We will see how to best utilize a multi-layer board to our advantage. We will discuss and debate inductor and copper it. We have some example schematic and layout of an EMI optimized evaluation board. We have a list of frequently asked questions that I answer. And at the end of the session, as Alan told you already, I try to answer the questions coming in during the session. Here's an example board that is thermally optimized, but not optimized for EMI. It does not have any input filters. It does not have a ground plane. It's a 
two layer board only. It has a huge switch node area on top and bottom, which will act as a patch antenna. And the result of this board, according to a CISPR 25 conducted emission test, is a disaster. Here's a much better board. It has an input filter placed on the bottom side of the PCB. It's a four layer board and it has a really good layout already. You can see it can pass the conducted emission test according CISPR 25, level five, but it might be a little bit tight on the more stringent OEM limits. Here's a much, much better board. It has significant margin to the tough OEM limits like here 12 dB microvolt average in the FM band conducted emission test. 12 dB microvolt is equal to four microvolt, which is nothing more than 80 nanoamps flowing in the 50 ohm input impedance of our EMC receiver. Almost nothing. Let's see how to get to this level. A quick reminder from last webinar from Christian is if we have a hot loop, so the input stage of a DC-DC buck converter with the two power MOSFETs in the input capacitor placed on top of a ground plane. So here, this is a ground plane and here we have the conductors of the hot loop. You see the highest current density concentrating in the center of these conductors due to skin effect and proximity effect. But still on the outer edges, you have a certain current density. This hot loop has, of course, an AC magnetic field that induces eddy currents in our copper. The eddy currents have the opposite direction to the conductor on top of them. In the center, in the very center, we would have current density zero. At the edge of this conductor block, we still have certain current density greater than zero. And actually, it goes up a little bit at the edges, similar to shown here. The distance of this loop above this ground plane um, is very important. It should be as small as possible. The higher it is, the wider the current will spread out in the copper. Let's look on, on a board. If we want to have really good EMC performance, we have to consider certain topics right from the beginning of the project. For example, if the DC-DC converter is placed too close to the connector and cables, the magnetic and electric field of the converter will couple into the connector and cable, and the cable will act as an antenna and radiate. Also, if we place the EMC filter components too close to the DC-DC circuit, they will pick up noise and we will not get the needed attenuation of the filter to pass EMI limits. So we have an EMI problem. Where to place the DC-DC converter? If we recall, in closed field condition, the field strength is reduced with one over distance in square. So what we can do is move the DC-DC as far away from the connector and cable as possible. At least three to five centimeters are needed to bring the field strengths at this connector and cable area to a level that we can pass EMI. A better solution is to place the DC-DC converter block on the bottom side of the, con of the PCB um, opposite to the connector under a solid copper area. The EMC filter components should be placed close to the connector. Here's a side view of a single side assembled PCB. We have the hot loop here. There's a DC-DC buck converter with the input capacitor. We have the hot loop and we have the magnetic field sketched. And we see below this inner layer one solid copper ground ideally, we don't have AC magnetic field anymore. In this picture, we also see that on this board, there is no quiet place to place the EMC filter components or connector to the cable. We'll have noise everywhere. What we can do is place a shield on top of the DC-DC and input capacitor and coil. And if we place a shield, we get a picture similar to this. Heatsink, for example, can also act as a shield. 
or the heat sink for LEDs, power LEDs on an LED driver board. So how to use the multi-layer PCB to our advantage? Here's a top side routing with the V-in copper, the power ground copper, the switch node copper. The switch node should be as small as possible. We have the inductor from switch to output area located here. And this is a hot loop. Of course, this is simplified. Actually, the current would run on the edges of the copper areas. And when we look at this board, we connect these noisy areas only through vias to the inner layers. So there is no direct connection from this power ground copper to the input ground copper area. So we use the vias. Every via that goes through this four layer board has around one nano Henry of inductance will act as a filter. So we use it to our advantage. We separate the grounds, also the power ground, the input noisy power ground of the power stage from the output ground and also from the surrounding grounds. The area under this DC-DC block, the DC-DC uh, ground reference is noisy because from the high DIDT loops on the top side, we will have eddy currents flowing in this. So this is not a clean area to connect to the connector. Layer three is our first solid ground reference. We also use it for some routings and bottom side of the PCB is also used for some routings and ground reference. Let's have a more three-dimensional look on the same thing. We have the high DIDT current loop again. We have the splits in the grounds and then we have a um, sketch of the eddy currents that are flowing in this blue inner layer ground one. These eddy currents have highest density under the loop, but also at the edges, as we recall. So also these eddy currents have magnetic field, and this magnetic field can couple into other traces and areas and connectors and cables. Layer three and four are quiet grounds and used as a system reference. And if we look at this noisy area, how it is connected to the critical connection area, we see that we have several vias, several inductors in series already that block noise. So this way we managed to establish a very clean ground reference for our filters and connector. One question that often discussed is copper under the inductor. Many people say, no, under the, directly under the inductor core, we have very strong AC magnetic fields that will induce eddy currents in the copper, create losses, and also will reduce the effective inductance. The other opinion is, yes, copper directly on the top layer to block any AC magnetic fields disturbing the inner layers of the PCB. So which opinion is right? Let's have a look. Here's an SMD bobbin type semi-shielded inductor placed on a four layer PCB. You see that under the core, there is no copper placed in all four layers. You also see that the start of winding of this inductor is connected to the switch node. This is usually helping to shield E-field radiation from the inductor. This is a sketch of the magnetic field lines. And you can see that the very strong field lines in the center of the coil will close around the PCB. And this way we couple or they couple into the cable, the connector and any component EMC filter. In the cutout area of each layer, we have very strong, very high current density from the eddy currents. On the top side copper, if there is a solid copper area, we will also see eddy currents forming and the eddy currents of course have an opposite magnetic field to the original magnetic field. This board has no quiet place to place EMC filters and a cable reference and it will be very bad for EMC. Let's have a more detailed look on a PCB with a hole in the center exposed to an AC magnetic field. The AC magnetic field can be from the hot loop or from the coil. In the center where we have the hole, 
the magnetic field goes straight through. In the surrounding copper, the AC magnetic fields will induce eddy currents. The current density right at the cutout edge will be very high. At the corner of this copper area, we will again see an increased current density. And these currents, the eddy currents, have also a magnetic field. Especially at the cutout and the edges, these fields are um, troublemakers because they can couple into other layers and uh, cables and connectors. Also, if you have this arrangement, the magnetic field could couple into adjacent PCBs. Another example is placing copper in layer four under the coil. So not directly under the inductor in layer four. The AC magnetic field will induce eddy currents in layer four. Also, we will see eddy currents at the edges of the other layers. But the benefit is now we don't have AC magnetic field under the PCB anymore. We don't have very strong field lines going around the PCB, only weak ones. And we have less crosstalk to adjacent PCBs if there are some placed. The problem is with this arrangement that the copper layers have uh, impedance greater than zero. So if we have high DIDT current flowing, these will create noise. So we have a noisy reference for our filter components and cable connection, which is bad for really good EMC performance. Another example is placing copper under the inductor in all layers. This way, the eddy currents will form in top layer. They will reduce the effective inductance value, maybe by 1%. They will also create some losses. But the benefit is that we block the AC magnetic field right here. So from the high magnetic field of the coil, we don't see um, field in layer two, three, and four. This board has a very clean layer four as a system reference, filter reference, and cable connection terminal. With this board, we can, with this setup, we can get a very good EMC performance. And of course, everywhere where we have solid copper, the AC magnetic fields will induce eddy currents. The eddy currents have a magnetic field that is opposite to the original field. And on top of the copper, it will tend to cancel the magnetic field. This is very important. Another problem that pops up if we place under the DC-DC circuit a solid copper area directly in the inner layer one is that we build a parasitic capacitance from the switch node to ground. So at the switch transition, we will have an AC current flowing across this capacitor. If we look at this 4430, three and a half amp, buck converter layout, we see that the switch node is roughly 30 millimeter, square millimeter large. And with 100 micrometer distance, we get around 100 picofarad of parasitic capacitance. This parasitic capacitance is in parallel to the lower MOSFET output capacitance, which is in the range from three nano to seven nano. So this is 30 times higher. The benefit of having a solid copper area under this is that we can uh, get eddy currents, mirror imaging the high DIDT currents from the top side of the PCB. And this way, they can cancel the magnetic field radiation on the top side of the board. And this is more important than the additional 100 picofarad parasitic capacitance. Let's have a look on our schematic for the EMC optimized board. We use a two-stage input filter consisting of a small 0805 size, one microhenry inductor that is able to handle more than three amps and two one microfarad 0805 capacitors placed here. This stage gives you us 19 dB attenuation at 450 kilohertz. The second stage we form with a 4.7 microhenry inductor and two 4.7 microfarad 
12 10 size capacitors. This stage adds another 45 dB. So in total, we around 64 dB. We get 40, 64 dB attenuation. This is a little bit more than we need. And today we use more like two micro Henry for L2 in a small size and still get 57 dB attenuation. In this calculation, we assume that the multilayer ceramic capacitors have around 50% of their nominal capacitance at the DC bias of certain volt from the car battery. In this schematic of our 4430 family, where we have pin-to-pin -pin parts from one amp to three and a half amp, you also notice that there is a 20 ohm resistance used with a bootstrap capacitor. This resistor has the effect to slow down the rising edge of the switch node, reducing ringing, but also it reduces the high frequency energy that is placed on the inductor. So we have less E-field radiation at high frequency when this resistor is used. In addition, you see that we split the frequency determining resistor in two. Um, this is an option for spread spectrum modulation. Here's a picture of the actual components used. So these are the two stage filter components, very tiny. And these are classical single stage 10 micro Henry, 10 micro, 10 micro Farad, 12, 10 size capacitors. Both stages have the same attenuation at fundamental frequency of 450 kilohertz, but this filter arrangement is much more wideband. Upside of the PCB, you notice in the center, we have V in coming up, routed to the V in pin of the chip in the center. You see the power ground area, which, uh, which has a U shape with two sets of capacitor with opposite orientation. So we will have two current loops with opposite orientation. You see the damping aluminum electrolyte capacitor. You also notice that we have two output capacitors placed on each side of this tiny inductor. So this tiny inductor is used because this is a one amp family member um, and we can use a very, very small inductor. And these capacitors actually shield part of the E-field radiation from the inductor. You also see that we have a cut around the power ground directly on top layer and the only connection to the rest of the grounds is through these vias. This way we effectively block high frequency content from the hot loop disturbing the rest of the PCB. The surrounding DC-DC ground reference, this is also the output capacitor reference, is also separated from the very quiet system ground to the cables at the input and output only through vias and then through the layer underneath. The picture of the bottom side of the board, you immediately see the two-stage filter arrangement with the symmetric placement of the filter capacitors. This way, we have the cans in opposite direction and we have less crosstalk into the cable and the other filter stage. You see the optional 555 circuit that we can use to test spread spectrum modulation. You also see a tiny O6 or three capacitor 10 nano placed directly at the point where my nice load resistor is connected. If you have a very large load or a cable or a, feed, a remote load via a cable, you have to add an LC low pass filter with around 100 to 200 nano Henry and these two of these small capacitors to filter the high frequency noise that is still getting through the inductor, the main inductor. Here's a detailed look on the top side. Again, you see the V-in area, the routing to the V-in pin. You see the U-shape power ground area on the top side, the two loops for the input cans with opposite direction. You see the symmetric placement. You also see here the analog ground connection to the output ground to the DC-DC converter ground reference. This is the inner layer one. Um, here it is very important that in the area directly under the IC with the two power MOSFETs and the input capacitors, we have no routings, no cuts. Actually, this VR for the in should move over here to get an even better performance. This area is needed to mirror image the high DIDT cans from the top side. You also noticed that we have a cut in inner layer one around this block. This cut 
an area is actually a little bit larger than the top side cut. So these cuts are not aligned. This is wider. And we have one ground connection where we root the intrace and the layer underneath. Same at the output, we have one ground connection connecting this block in the inner layer one to the rest of the board where we have the output signal routed to the load. This is the inner layer two, layer three in total. You see the in routing into the DC-DC block and the V-out routing. This is directly under the ground connection in the layer above. You also see that we have ground with lots of via everywhere and the routings are covered in ground. So we don't have crosstalk between the signals. We treat this DC-DC block like a four pole. We have a signal or the load current from the source into our block and at the same position in the adjacent layer, the return. Same at the output, we have the trace to the load and in the adjacent layer, directly at the same position, the return pass. The bottom side, you see solid ground in the center of the PCB. You see the EMC filter components, the 555 block and the small cap. If you check this area with a magnetic field probe, you should not see many magnetic fields. If you see strong magnetic fields, you have a problem in the routing and you will have problems to pass EMI tests. This is a result of all our efforts. This is a radiated monopole test, the low frequency radiated test. When you switch at 470 kilohertz, usually you have a hard time to pass the limits with the first harmonic. In this case, we are 5 dB below the CISPR 25 level five limit. And this is due to the fact that we use a very small inductor that does not stand off much from the PCB, a very small switch area, and that these capacitors are placed in a way that they take some of the E-field radiation. If you change the inductor, for example, to a four and a, five, four and a half millimeter high type that has these clips at the side to connect to the winding, and if this four and a half millimeter high antenna is sitting at the switch node, you will see that this first peak will go up by around six to seven dB. Um, and another approach is to use coils with an E shield on top of it. These are the IHL E from Vishai. They also help on this. We have conducted emission test results of this board. Here's a low frequency using spread spectrum. Without spread spectrum, you would see one single needle that is around 10 dB higher, same here and here. And in the high frequency conducted emission average, you see a very clean result with large margin to the tough OEM limit. Here's a different picture of the 4430, the 3M variant of this family with a bigger six by six millimeter coil, actually two coils compared. In green, we have the coil that is six millimeter high and has an undefined start of winding. So we don't know how it was winded. In pink, you see the three millimeter height part, and this is easily 60 B better on, on both bands. This is the easiest way to get a better, better performance. Last slide is showing the radiated emission with a biconical antenna from 30 megahertz to 200 megahertz. Average result, horizontal polarization, which was worse than the vertical, but it's around noise level. It's very, very clean. Let's come to the frequently asked questions about layout for EMC. Why the aluminum alco at the V-in? It's for damping the high Q tank circuit formed by the cable and the ceramic input capacitors. It also stands off the PCB by several millimeters and helps to collect some of the E-field radiation from the inductor. Is there any difference in output filtering for a buck and a boost topology? We discussed the buck converter layout and filtering and the buck converter has a fully switched input current which is very noisy. So you need all this filtering that we discussed. The boost converter is a mirror image of a buck. So the output side is fully switched and we need all this filtering effort we discussed on the output of a boost converter. 
How about a four switch buck boost converter? Depending on the duty cycle or the V in to V out ratio, both input and output can be switched. So we need filtering on both sides. Shall I connect analog and power ground at the power IC? I covered this. So power ground is very noisy. It's only connected through vias. And the analog ground is, is referred to the output ground of the output capacitor, which is the quiet ground of the circuit. Whenever you can, you should go for more than four layers if commercially available. Um, as you can see in our layout already, we do some compromises. And with um, six layers, for example, you can use a full layer two and five as ground planes, and you will get an even better EMC performance. Should you keep any areas free of copper? Everything that is not used for routing should be used with ground, with copper, ground copper. But in each corner of these areas, you need to have vias to ground to make sure these structures don't act as antennas. If you cannot connect these areas with vias, you better take them out. Otherwise, they will act as patch antennas. So these so-called finger structures that have a long um, edge without a via, you should remove them. Does the input connector shape elevation above the board has an influence on EMI? Everything that stands off the PCB can act as an antenna for radiation, but also for receiving. So a connector that is very high, elevated above the PCB, is collecting more noise than a flat one. The NC pins and the thermal pad of IC should be connected to ground. Ground is always the most steady potential in the board. What is the optimum number and spacing of ear holes to connect the top layer ground to the internal ground? This depends. If we have a noisy area, we only use as many vias as needed, as absolutely needed to carry the current. If we have a quiet area and we need to transfer heat, we use more vias. So this is the end of the general session. I will now look into the questions and try to answer them. Um, as Ellen mentioned, um, there's one question, are we able to download the slides? Yes, we will provide a PDF of the webinar later on. There's another question, if you use a common mode choke, do you pour ground under this device as well? A common mode choke on an input of an automotive system is usually not such welcome because you have, um, this way you increase the ground impedance, you block common mode noise. This is typically E-field radiation from the inductor. And um, you have usually other connections to ground of your board. The chassis of the car is ground. So you, um, you have a CAN bus or whatever, other signals, and then you get another ground reference or ground connections that will bypass or can potentially bypass your common mode choke. And under the common mode choke, you probably don't do copper. Usually we don't, we try to avoid common mode chokes whenever possible. Did you test the EVQ test board with half of the vias shown and you saw a significant difference in EMI performance? No, we did not test with less vias, um, but we did test really one-to-one -to -one tests with and without these cuts in top and inner layer, and we have seen a significant difference. Um, another question is, what if you can only use ceramic caps? Um, are there alternatives? Um, the ceramic cap is in principle very good for the uh, EMC performance because it's very low inductance, very low ESR. Um, the only thing is the damping and um, the, the, the damping of the high Q input circuit. Um, you can use uh, ceramic caps um, in series with a small resistor like one ohm, but the damping capacitance should be at least two times better, three times larger than the undamped capacitance. Another question is what if cost prohibits four layer? <laughs> yeah, two layer is very difficult. Um, I can show um, an, an example and discuss it with you, but it's uh, 
tough. Um, the last question I see here, are there further considerations for immunity performance? So um, in principle, uh, the EMC filters are working bidirectional. So if you really have uh, low radiation of the board, you also immune um, to uh, external noise sources at these frequencies. Um, in the backup slide, I have the two layer example. And actually the problem start that on the two layer board, your, your potential ground area is more than a millimeter away. Um, compared to the um, 100 micrometer uh, distance between the hot loop and the inner layer ground that we uh, really recommend, you have already a 15 to 20 dB um, disadvantage in the magnetic field cancellation of the hot loop. Yeah? So the eddy currents um, are far away and um, you don't get the good cancellation. The other thing is um, you have to somehow route all the signals. So you, you will not have this ideal ground plan that I sketched here. So you will have routings and these routings will increase the impedance of the ground plane. And also um, they, you can couple directly from, from your uh, circuit into, into the ground. Um, so this is much more difficult to establish on a two layer board. Um, so one thing is clear, if you have to do two layer, you have to make sure that under this block, you have a solid ground area, no routings there. You really have to find ways to spread the signals away that you don't cut the ground under the hot loop area. This is very important. And you, you, have, you have a hard time to separate the noisy ground where you have the eddy currents from your connector ground without increasing the general ground impedance because the ground is your system reference. If you have any transients here, you don't want to have a huge impedance from here to there, otherwise you get potential differences. Okay, I hope this helps. Um, there's a last question coming in, how to optimize internal noise frequency of DC-DC converter, for example, two hertz megahertz, which shows issue in two meg meter band. So in general, um, if you compare a 500 kilohertz switching frequency to two megahertz, you will get around 12 dB higher noise um, in fixed frequency in the FM band. Um, here we have a spread spectrum example um, which is 60 B higher. Um, so this is always a disadvantage. Um, and if you have very tough limits, with two megahertz on car battery input, you have a hard time. What we have learned is that this noise here um, is usually with a really good layout dominated by the E-field radiation from the inductor. So you should definitely not use something like this. You should use an inductor um, that um, has a very flat and a defined start of winding and nothing sticking up that is carrying switch node. Any more questions? Jens, uh, just one last one that came in through the chat app. Uh, the question is, the heat sink is aluminum normally. How can it act as a shield for magnetic fields in the buck converter example? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, it's the heat sink was actually used to block E-field radiation from, from the um, inductor and the switch node. And for shielding magnetic field, you need high conductivity copper. This is giving much better result. So this is a good catch. Okay, <laughs> folks, uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our uh, second automotive EMI focus webinar. Like we mentioned at the start of, of today's sessions, we will be continuing this series in 2019, diving deeper into EMI and also focusing on some other automotive power management topics. Today's webinar will be available for streaming later, as well as you'll be able to download the presentation in a PDF format. We'll make this available uh, and you'll get the notification 
through email. Now, if you'd like to also take a look at our previous webinars, everything's available at monolithicpower.com slash webinars. Again, that's monolithicpower.com slash webinars. And of course, we'll include a link to this in the email that will be sent to all participants uh, later today or tomorrow. So folks, thanks again for joining us and a special thank you to Jens Hedrick, our EMC expert for hosting this really informative session. And we'll see you next time.